1920 Kings insider and creator of the Kings beat James Ham with us. James, you're looking at your phone. Do you have anything? What, 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 what are the streets telling you? What are the offices telling you? What, what is David Stern, David J. Stern walk way Boulevard telling you what, what is happening? Why is it three o'clock? And we, it's 6 PM Eastern time, James. What do we got? Tumbleweeds. Uh, it's quiet. It's quiet. I I've checked in with just about everyone you can check in with this morning and it's been super quiet all day. Um, I think they are in final decision mode. Uh, they are probably working on an offer for one of these guys, uh, and then hoping that, uh, they, they make the right decision. So, um, Mm. lots of, uh, this, this, uh, comprehensive and process, driven search for the 20th head coach of the Sacramento area era of Kings basketball, I think is, uh, is nearing an end, but, um, exactly when that will happen, whether it's later on today, whether it's tomorrow, uh, whether it's Monday, um, How about I, would now? Hate, I would hate to see them do it on mother's day. Oh, that would just, that would just be a disaster. Well, but, yeah. well, then I would just ask why Monty McNair hates mothers. That's why. <laughs> that's what I would ask. Why? Why, why do you got hate mothers? Yeah. Why? Like, look, look, look what you <laughs> look what you did to James and D'Lo and Kenny. We, we Deuce and Mo established they don't care. So that, that it doesn't matter for that. Poor Brandon Nunez, Sean Cunningham. Got got to send all these people to work. Come yeah, on, Monty. that would not be the move, Monty. Come on, man. You know better than that. And let's be honest. Don't do it tomorrow either. No. Because do it now, D- James. Send a group <laughs> message to all of them. Ever. Just do. Send the old Steve Austin on the top rope gif where he's looking at his watch. Like, what are we doing? Yeah, yeah this is definitely one of those moments where if I look down at my phone and it has a, sp- a couple of names on it, I- yep. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to like. Hey, I'll We've be established back. that. Yeah, we 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 just we just we just tipped everybody to the fact that like, one, every time you look down on your phone, I'm gonna ask you who's texting you. Two, if you get the right call. We've got you've you've got to go. You got to go. Really now that now that you've got to come back. Oh yeah, but yeah. I come back. You got you got to go. You got to go. Yeah, that's the plan. I, I mean, look, we have no idea. Um, you know, this thing is close, so it's close. That's what we've been hearing all week. That we're we're down to the. You can't be the, looking down like that, Ham. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're down to the we're down to the wire here. We are, and um, you know, I I don't think, I mean, it is getting a little late in the day. Um, and if it was good news, um, you, you know, you would hope that they would, uh, they wouldn't do a Friday news stuff, <laughs> but, uh, Wait a minute. <laughs> What's you know, bad news? well, I don't know. I mean, like, I, I think, you know, Steve like, Clifford, we're not going to have a coach this year. No, I, I mean, from, again, from what I've heard, like the conversations I've had with most people, um, they believe it's a two man race at this point between Mark Jackson and, uh, and Mike Brown. And um, we're just waiting to hear it. And I mean, again, I- I've had multiple people at this point tell me, like, look, if Mike Brown is offered the job, he will take the job. Not only that, but he's excited to get the mm-hmm. job. If he does get it, he is excited to get the job. And um, y- we're just waiting to see who uh, who wins the internal struggle. Uh, that That's what this comes down to, like, is... Mark's uh, got to work at 630. So like, <laughs> let's be respectful here. Don't make that man do a I broadcast. Go work, man. Man. <laughs> you guys got to I got to go to work. Got a decision yet? What's going on? <laughs> yeah. Um, James, recency bias, sure. Do you remember a coaching search like this or have they all been like this? Or is this one a little more intense, a little more, a little, a little more wild than, than some in the past? No, this is standard. I, I think the thing that separates this one from most of the other ones is that the Kings jumped in early, right? They really did jump in at, as early as they possibly could and started ramping this thing up. So we kept waiting. We're like, we're like, why haven't we heard anything? It's been like a week. But now it looks like we're going to be start to finish in, in I, I think it's been two weeks. It's been two weeks since we had the list of seven. And uh, that's a pretty quick turnaround to get a head coach. Um, but I also think that, you know, they were aggressive here. They needed to be aggressive, and they were. They got um, their list of candidates out before, uh, well, right after the Charlotte Hornets uh, let go of James Borrego. So, of course, you got out in front of those guys. 
Um, the Lakers, I, who knows what they're doing? Um, they're they're clearly they're consulting, um, you know, uh, the the great Phil Phil Jackson, but uh, that that usually takes a little while because Phil's a dude who you know is sitting on a ranch somewhere doing something. <laughs> You're, they're and, actually sending letters to Phil. They're just waiting for him to respond back. Or that's smoke signals. Way. Yeah, that's I mean, the only it's way possible. To get a hold just, of him. <laughs> just full fledged smoke signals to Phil Jackson. Um, yeah, he's a different cat, and you know, he's gonna have his uh, process driven and thorough uh you know uh, approach as well so yeah it, it, it's awkward um we're all just sitting here waiting and and you know eventually something will happen eventually yeah eventually well, well we're gonna do the same exact show monday because we're just gonna be sitting here like <laughs> hey you know, it's at some point you gotta name them at some point um so is there's like no chance at all monty mcnair likes mark jackson Oh, no, I, there's a chance that he likes Mark Jackson. Um, you know, these guys all came in, they interviewed, and let's be honest, uh, the first round of interviews did not include Vivek Ranadive. Now, they're, so so Monty and Wes, they brought, uh, they brought him to the second round. And, um, I, well, I'd also say at that point, Joe Dumars was there, um, mm-hmm. and he, he helped usher this to the second round. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, if you're going to sit down and and interview these guys for a second time, you're going to get them in Sacramento, you're going to hang out with them. Um, maybe he did make an incredible impression on him. And, you know, sometimes that's all it takes. And I know that it was going to come down to really the Mike Brown interview um, where he was here on Thursday night. And, you know, there was a lot riding on that for Mike Brown as well. Like, it, this wasn't a foregone conclusion. He's not just, like, the de facto guy. Uh, Mm -hmm. there, there is a lot of discussions going on and, you know, again, I don't know if, you know, it's, it's even possible that, uh, Mark Jackson was greenlit through the first round, um, because that was, you know, they, they said, okay, is there one guy that you want to see make it to the second round to Vivek? And he said, yeah, that could be it. Uh, You know, just to speculate Mm -hmm. there, there's Mark Jackson got a buy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, no, he did, he did sit down through interviews from what I've heard and, um, but I mean, this is a really, really important hire for the Kings, and they've mm-hmm. got to get it right. If they rush it uh, and they get it wrong, then you know, you take an extra day, take an extra two days. You know, there's nothing that tells us like what's the difference between now and be- between having the same conversation on Monday. Um, either way, I don't think you can have a press conference if it is like Mike Brown. You can't really have a press conference, and unless you can really fit it into a small window. And mm-hmm. pretty difficult. James, purely speculation, gut feeling. Do you think they still don't know which way they want to go as an organization, like right now? No, I, I think they probably know. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I think that they're they're working out details. They're working out what it is that they're um, that they want to do here and how they want to present it. Um, you know, yeah, I'm pretty sure at, at this point, maybe they're having like one last discussion between like the big group of, of guys that are, are making this final decision. Um, but it's not nearly as big a group as it was before. You know, it's a pretty small group of people uh, that are sort of in this inner sanctum. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think, again, like this is such a monumental coaching hire. It's a huge coaching hire. You have to get it right this time um, because of just the streak, the 16-year streak, but also – where you're at with your players, where you're at with your roster, where Monty's at um, as far as contractually and stuff. It, it, it's a big, big hire. Do you know who's in that circle outside the three obvious of Monty and Wes Welker, as we call him here on this show? And, yeah, um, Wes Wilcox. <laughs> um, Vivek? Yeah, I, I mean, it's going to be, I mean, there might be some other people mixed in there. Um, like Anil Rana uh, mm. you know, there, there might be some other voices within the ownership group, um, guys like Raj Bathal and stuff like that. But I think it's, it's pretty, it's a pretty tight group here of, of people making this decision. So one thing that I, I've kind of moved a little bit on, Damien doesn't even know this is I was dead set that it was going to be Mark Jackson for most of the week. 
if you want my official guess, I'm still going to go with Mark, but I, I got a feeling it might be Mike Brown. I got a feeling it might be him. I don't know, but he's gained a lot of traction and for me personally in the last week or so. I swayed you. He's, he sway, he swayed I, I me. Swayed you. And, you know, seeing some tea leaves, seeing some tea leaves, you know, listening to the, to the Kings beat, hearing some tea leaves, you know, it's like, uh, I see where they're going with this one right here. Do you think that I asked that saying, do you think that that this this group was swayed at all in these second round of interviews? Do they seem like that type of group where maybe they didn't know what they wanted to do and they were swayed by some guys? Or I take that back. Maybe they had an idea. Like, for instance, they wanted Steve Clifford. Steve Clifford's the guy. We're just going to finish out these interviews. And then maybe they were blown away by Mark or Mike. And they said, you know what, I don't I, I'd rather have one of these two guys. You think that's a possibility with these guys? Yeah, I think everyone came in with sort of an idea. And and then that idea, you know, if you're doing this job right, you're collecting data everywhere that you can and and trying to figure out what's the best, who is the best fit. And you need as much information as possible to make that final decision. And so, yeah, you have to keep an open mind walking into it. Um, you know, I. I don't have to keep an open mind walking into it. You don't have to keep an open mind walking into it. But I think that that's where we're at. We're at this point where, uh, you know, they needed to take it all in. You need to collect so much information on these guys and get a feel and see what the repercussions would be of, of bringing in a guy like Mark Jackson. Uh, see if, if you really have a shot at a guy like Mike Brown. Uh, you know, it's one thing for someone to say, yeah, I'll do an interview. It's a whole nother thing for them to really jump in and uh, and say, yes, I want to be a candidate. And so, like, look, I, I think in this process, they, they probably learned a lot about all of these guys, but also this is the first time around for Monty McNair. This is the first time he's been through this to hire his own coach. And that's a big deal too. You know, you want him to be thorough in his process and kind of figure out what he feels comfortable with. And, and if he needs to be proactive and sway somebody and, and make his argument, or maybe he needs to be more open-minded about a, a guy like Mark Jackson and, and like have someone else sway him. Like there's a reason why these processes take, you know, two weeks. It's because you do need to really do your due diligence on every single one of these guys. The Kings are paying Alvin next year, right? They're paying Alvin, but they're paying him as an assistant. They're not paying him as a, as a head coach. So Alvin to, to uh, as an assistant, they're paying Luke next year. They're playing Vlade next year. Uh, attendance stunk. We're, we're not far removed from the pandemic if we're removed from it at all. So the financial losses of this organization are still, they. I, I have to imagine they're still at the forefront of their mind. You told us uh, earlier this week, and you mentioned it on the wonderful latest edition of the Kings Beat podcast, um, that you know, the, the, kind of the hiring assistance is going to be really important and the budget for hiring assistance is really important. Are they, are the Kings willing to let's, let's get this done. Let's get the best candidate and allow him to put together the best possible staff. Are they, are the Kings that open to this? I think so. Yeah. I mean, they're always going to have, you're always going to have a budget, right. Uh, of who you can bring in and who you can't. Um, you know, we're starting to hear like murmurs of, you know, if this guy is a head coach, maybe this guy could be an assistant type stuff. Um, but it, at the end of the day, like, I, I think that the Kings are going to do right by these guys and let them have, uh, not carte blanche, but like within reason, they'll mm -hmm. have the ability to bring in the group that they want to bring in. And, you know, like coaching salaries of coaches who are no longer here, it's kind of part of the business, you know, like, again, the, the assistant group of Doug Christie and um, Lindsey Harding and, you know, Alvin, you can put in that group, but uh, Jonah Hershkew and all those guys, like they all have one year deals next year. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter at all. So whether they're going to be here or not is fully going to be, you know, decided behind the scenes between management, between a, a new head coach coming in, whether those guys will be uh, on the, on the bench next year. James, so you're the best of your abilities. Um, can you maybe talk about like what, do you have an idea of what Monty, Wes, Vivek 
are looking for in a head coach. So we we know obviously defense is one of them. I've said the biggest priority, in my opinion, is finding somebody that fits perfectly with De'Aaron Fox and can get the absolute most out of him. Is that along the lines of what they were looking for with the head coach? Like what what have you heard in that respect? Is is the one of the the most important thing or one of the most important things? Yeah, the most important thing was uh, defense and a an experienced hand, someone that that's been there. Uh, those were the two things that I were I was told that they they really they look at this thing and they they understand that this defense has been so bad for so long, and they've tried to do things like bring in offensive coaches, but then surround them with good defensive coaches or defensive coaches throughout the league. And it just hasn't worked at all. So like Bob Beyer um, was a the defensive assistant the first year of, of uh, Luke Walton. Um, I think last year is Rex Kalamian. And then this year, um, oh, why am I going to draw a blank? Um, uh, Mike Longombardi. So yeah, you know, they're, they're cycling through assistant coaches that have a defensive mindset. And I think at, at a certain point, what you have to realize is that if your head coach doesn't have that as well, isn't pulling that way as well, um, then you're really, really going to struggle. And uh, and they have. They've been one of the worst defenses we've ever seen in the NBA, um, historically bad the last couple of years. And you got to have a, a new mindset at the top that we're going to prioritize defense. We're going to take some of these other things that are fun and exciting and maybe tone them down a little bit and really put that focus in in the right place because winning really does depend on your ability to stop somebody. It doesn't matter how many points his team scores. They always find a way to give up more, and that's that equates to L's, uh, which is why this team continues to put up records like 30 and 52. Uh, it's not just you and us who are anxious to hear uh, who the Kings' next head coach is going to be. It's also uh, James's dog. Uh, that's who you keep hearing. James, the, 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 yeah. the pug keeps running in like, Dad, what's popping? Is it, <laughs> do we got it or not? No? Yeah. All right. I'll be back in a couple of seconds. Yeah. Um. So defense, obviously a focal point for the Sacramento Kings in, in this coaching search. But with 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 the experience also being factored in, is this is this kind of the clearest? You know, because there was a lot of nonsense out there following the Sabonis Halliburton trade about oh the Kings just made a win now move. Well, you, you can have your argument about that particular move, but combined with this, an experienced coach now it feels a whole lot more like a. You, you better win a whole lot sooner than you would have if we had hired Darvin Ham or Charles Lee. Yeah, I, I think that what we're seeing is that they are trying to skip. Um, not, I, I don't even want to say skip ahead. Probably skip to where they should be. You know, you're you're get back on track. Yeah, your or, star level player in De'Aaron Fox is 24 years old. Um, you've got uh, a 25 year old Demontis Sabonis. Like, I, I think you need to align with them. Uh, they're about to enter their prime. And that means that you probably need a coach that isn't here to like establish something as much as they are here to like push the right buttons and start directing this thing um, towards the playoffs. And uh, like they don't have the talent right now to make the playoffs, but that doesn't mean they won't have the talent on July 10th Mm -hmm. to make the playoffs. We don't know that. Uh, We're going to have to wait and see what happens. We're going to have to wait and see what happens on May 17th when the lottery balls are are pulled out of the hopper. We're going to have to wait and see where they're at, you know, uh, on draft night, where they're at July 1st. Um, All of these, like, little steps that are coming. The biggest thing, I I think, is to get a coach in here that has an identity that you can build around. And, again, I think at least two of them have a really strong identity of who they are as a coach in Steve Clifford and Mike Brown. Uh, like I, there are a lot of things that, you know, I don't like about my, uh, Mark Jackson's candidacy. There's a ton of things that are like outside of the realm of basketball. There are a lot of those things that seeped into the walls in, in golden state. But at the end of the day, my biggest issue with him has always been the one simple thing. And that is that he has three years total of coaching experience. 
He hasn't played in the NBA for like 18 years. He hasn't coached in the NBA for eight years. The other guys are all like they have so much more experience, just raw experience. I mean, it Darvin Ham and, and Charles Lee and uh, Will Hardy had more experience than Mark Jackson as a coach in the NBA. That's just it is what it is. Like you can't get around the actual numbers. Mm-hmm. And and so that's where, uh, you know, I, I think I even wrote it in, in a piece yesterday that if you look at the situations that Mark Jackson, you know, all of the things, there's so many different things that happened during his three years in, uh, in Golden State. That's a big reason why he only lasted three years. It, it wasn't because he was doing a horrible job. He was actually doing a really good job on the court. Um, but if you look at the other two candidates that have made it to round two, they have a combined 42 years of NBA coaching experience, and not one of them has anything like even the smallest thing that we've seen about Mark Jackson. You know, that's a long time to not get in any trouble. Uh, And it's kind of, you know, like that's, it has to go into the, the equation. Like it, it does, especially like you can say, well, the Kings are so far on, you know, this side of the fence. They're so far left with all of their thinking. Well, I hate to tell you this, but 29 other teams have not hired Mark Jackson. 29 other teams have not taken the plunge uh, in the last eight years with Mark Jackson. So it's not just the Kings and, you know, how people call it their wokeness or whatever it might be. Um, it's it's an issue. It is an issue. And sure, we have players that are coming out and saying, oh, Mark Jackson needs to be back in the league. It's like, that's fine. They can have those opinions. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about choosing the right guy who's going to be a figurehead for your team, who's going to have a pregame and postgame like press conference every single game. And they're going to be at every single practice having a conversation with the media. Like he is, we want to say the face of the franchise is De'Aaron Fox or DeMontis Sabonis. The real face of the franchise is usually the head coach. He's the one who talks upwards of 200 times a year or, or 150 times a year. The other guys, they talk when they have good games. They talk when things have gone wrong. But at the same time, you know, I, I just think it's it's a little, you got to make sure you have the right guy, the guy that people, everyone feels comfortable with inside the walls and all that stuff. And so, again, I, like if they feel comfortable with Mark Jackson, then we move forward with Mark Jackson. That's that's the way it goes, right? Mm-hmm. Um, this, it, the opening press conference won't be nice uh it, it'll be awkward and have a bunch of weird questions uh sent at both monty mcnair and mark jackson but um at the same time once you get past that opening press conference it's game on it's about basketball like let's move forward and let's figure out what happens unless we have an incident then we we backtrack and then it becomes pulling out all of those things again and and mulling through them again um, well said, James. Um, can you kind of, you know, everybody's broken this thing down as much as possible. But for for those who haven't gone through a whole breakdown of um, more so X's and O's of why Mike Brown is a great potential guy for the Sacramento Kings, I think everybody knows about what he's able to do on the defensive end. But offensively, I don't, I don't feel like the cupboard is bare with what he's able to do and what he's learned offensively. Can you talk about maybe what he would be bringing if, if he ended up being the, the Kings next head coach? Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, I think the first thing you can say is that a lot of his, his tenure in the league has been with players like LeBron James and mm-hmm. players like Kobe Bryant for a small window. So he has always had like an elite player to build around. Um, but at the same time, like, look, I think that's one of the most interesting things about Mike Brown. Not only he's known as this defensive guru, he's he's done incredible things, improving defenses every stop that he goes to. But then the last six years, um, he spent with Steve Kerr, and you know, who has one of the most offensively gifted teams that we've ever seen, but who also, I believe, finishes season number one in the league in defensive rating, and. That's, you know, he ran the defense for Steve Kerr, but he's also in every single one of these meetings. He spent six years basically getting his PhD in the Steve Kerr School of Offensive Genius. 
that's a really smart thing to do. If you're a defensive minded coach and you've had a run and you've had a second run and maybe a third run that didn't work out, um, you need to go back to the drawing board and you need to work on your deficiencies. And I think that that's what he's done. And that's a really, really smart way to approach things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like Mike Brown, man. I think uh, he's yeah, he's a good coach. He's a really good coach, and, and more than anything, I think he deserves another opportunity. If it happens here in Sacramento, that's great. If it doesn't, I think he still deserves another opportunity somewhere relatively soon. He, he's he's a good coach. Yeah, and I'll say this too: like I, I see it all the time. You know, it's not like Mark Jackson got arrested for something. It's not like Mark Jackson broke the law, but. That doesn't really matter. Like what we're talking about is building a culture here in Sacramento. If there's one thing that's lacking in Sacramento, it's a culture. And a lot of the things that we're talking about were either positive or ne negative influences on a culture. And I, they're not even like the religious stuff it doesn't even stand out so much. Did Mark as, have uh, a positive impact on establishing the culture in Golden State? I think he did. I think he did. But I also... Like with just a basketball team, he did, but that's not. It, it's a he runs a me a, a, and us against them mentality, and that's that's sort of like the prevailing thought, uh, the prevailing like conversations that I have as I'm going through the league, and it's a lot of that. It's it's like it's but who's us. them? Well, it depends on the day because oh. you know we we talked about the Festus Azili thing mm -hmm. that. Festus Azili at one point became the them against, you know, and the front office on occasion. Like we know, uh, even Steph Curry is, has admitted the that when Monte Ellis was, was traded, that Mark Jackson went to him and said, hey, they were going to trade you, and I talked them into trading Monte instead. That's not what I've heard is true at all. Like around the league, no one else has that except for Mark Jackson. That, I, that I've talked to, there are multiple people who have said, yeah, no, that's not how that thing was going to play out at all, that it wasn't, it's not like a Fox and Halliburton situation where someone's, you know, that's not what went down. And it's, it's his way of making, like, you one of his guys, like, it's us against them all the time. And, you know, when you're playing an opponent, that works. And sometimes that that's the way you got to pull people in and make them part of the family and make your guys feel comfortable. But I, I think there was a lot of that. And, you know, there's a lot of other things that he does that like get under people's skin. Like you can go through and read all kinds of things. I can, you know, I've taken plenty of phone calls on some of the things that happen, but a lot of those things are really small. You know, there's the, the team plane. He won't let anybody eat on the team plane until he's eating until he's on the team plane and wants to eat. Like there's a control mechanism that he had in place. Now, a lot of those things can, that could have just been situational. He won't do that or he's realized that that's something that he's gotten chastised about, like these weird stories about him. Um, and maybe he won't do things out that way this time around. But still, there's there's enough smoke uh, to be at least a fire. And it's about the size of the fire. That's usually the question mark and uh, and how destructive that can be and so again i like some of those things you just like throw to the side and you say well that's that's really not that big of a deal but other things you're like okay w what is the end game what are we trying to do here how are we trying to build this thing and um and culture again in sacramento is the the biggest issue that they have more than anything i mean talent is a problem but culture is so far above all of those other things. And you want to make sure that you get a guy who can build a culture. Guys, I'm beginning to wonder if we're going to find out today. Oh, 1320 <laughs> Kings inside of James Ham with us here on Dealer One KC. We're back with more. There's plenty more to talk about here on Sacramento's number one sports station, ESPN 1320. Sorry, I know that's a little early, Jesse. Oh, man. Poor Southern Utah softball team. Mm. They're three and thirty-eight on the season. Mm. Who is mm -hmm. Southern Utah softball? Mm -hmm. They're losing to Sac State right now, 
12 to 2 in the third inning, and they had to get two runs in the third inning to get it from 12 to nothing to 12 to 2. Tragic. Those poor young ladies just playing their hearts out. Yikes. You can't even make plans this weekend, can you, James? Um, well, I, I am on Sunday. Uh, you know, it's Mother's mm. Day, and then it's also my son's birthday on the same day. Um, Which so, one? My oldest. Nice. Yeah. 20? Yeah. Or 19. 19. 19. Yeah. So, anyway. Yeah, awesome. I, I think that this is a like a really interesting thing, and it, and it's very divisive, like how this is all played out. Um, you know, like a lot of the religious stuff that like jumps off the the table, they become they're almost like like parables. They're they're like stories of you know strange things that happened during his time in Golden State. But like you should be able to look past some of those things, or if you have a bunch of players who say, hey. Uh, like we're not into that, then you're still going to, uh, you know, you're going to be able to move forward without that as part of, as part of what he does. I mean, it doesn't mean he won't bring it up on multiple occasions and stuff, but like it, the religious stuff, like that's not a deciding factor for me. My deciding factor is he's the least experienced coach. Like, you know, he just doesn't have the, the overall experience to do to do this job and even like if you want to factor in his playing career it's just so he's so far removed from all of it and like just because you're on a on a show talking basketball you know there are varying degrees of of prep and he's he's not a the lead analyst he's a lead analyst he's not the the play-by-play guy on a show and play-by-play guys and and oh uh, hosts well sorry about that hosts of like pre and post game those guys do so much work so much more work than analysts like a- any one of them you can just walk around like jim Cosmore, incredible amount of prep work every single game mm-hmm. um and then you know like guys like myself like i spend I- i'm in the locker room until about 10 minutes before i'm on the air but i've been collecting data in a different way and like i'm saturated in it they're not so much saturated in it like we are but they are. I disagree. In, like, I think that comes down to the individual and not the position. That's a hundred percent the individual. Yeah, analyst I mean, like, were, uh, a good analyst busted. Doug Christie busted his ass when. Oh he no! Had totally, that job. totally. Like a no. good analyst will put a lot of work into that position. I agree with that, but I also will tell you that a lot of Doug's prep was for both radio and and the the show and Doug had a radio show i didn't know <laughs> yeah yeah so so that's where I, I think like um I, I do see like some guys that are prepping and prepping and prepping and like i prep in a different way i prep by writing four stories that day so mm-hmm. like the the way that i saturate myself with the with what's happening is different like i had somebody ask me to go on a podcast and they're like hey i'm gonna send you a list of questions i'm like yeah you don't need to send me a list of questions <laughs> Like I can usually riff it about for 10 minutes on just about anything that you want to throw at me. It's fine. Um, I, I don't, you know, again, I, I do prepare, but I, my preparation is, it's just in a totally different way. It's, it's for my writing and all that stuff. It looks like Jojo's playing tonight. Man, that motherfucker tough boy. Heart of a lion. That dude is tough. Oh, he'll kill a lion. He he don't want no heart of a lion. He'll kill a lion. <laughs> I think when he was like eleven. But uh, that's funny. Joel's a tough dude, man. Damn. Yeah, he's tough. He's had a lot tough of injury man. problems. Yeah. <sighs> oh, this was terrible. This was terrible. Just terrible. James, make your phone ring. I know, man. I I know. It's coming back. Dealer one KC brought to you by McQueen and the Violet Fog, the smoothest gin in the world, handcrafted in Brazil. Thirteen twenty Kings Insider. Uh, and creator of the King's Beat, James Ham, here with us. Looks like Joel Embiid's going to go tonight. Come on, man. Uh, our man Keith Pompey 
posted some videos of him warming up. Adrian Wojnarowski's on the television right now talking about his likely return. That dude is that's, tough, man. That's the type of stuff right there that in Philadelphia, I know we all have our feelings about Philadelphia, but they they won't forget. They man. won't forget. Hey. They, won't, they always remember JoJo and him going out there later on the line, one eye, no thumb. That, 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 that dude, <laughs> right, that's the thing. That dude's out there with a broken face and a <laughs> jacked up thumb. I want to see him wearing a patch and like a, a giant, a giant thumb. Uh, he's got a, he's got to rock the old Undertaker. Uh, remember when uh, when Mabel broke Undertaker's face and he had to wear that mask? He needs to rock one of them joints. He needs to rock the black, the black mask. Like I, who did? I think Braun wore the black mask. Braun wore the black mask. Yeah. He he's, he's got to rock the black mask. That's 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 what. Uh, or the old school hockey mask, just you know. Yeah, it was. It, it, it would be great. It would be great to see. Uh, I, <laughs> hey, I want to answer something man. from the chatty house. Uh, oh boy! Uh, I'll just flash this up. Uh, um, Mark Jackson got uh, one fifty one games. Got to the second round. How many other cat candidates have done that? Uh, Mike Brown has a six sixteen <laughs> career win percentage. Has been to the NBA Finals, <laughs> and has yeah. He has a. You a, missed the playoffs like once. <laughs> yeah, his his uh, his record. Uh, oh yeah, there we go. Uh, nothing. I, I okay, did, don't do yeah. that. Don't do that. Don't That's, do that. It's an Embiid. It's an Embiid don't notification. It's an Embiid notification. Sorry, we are not here yeah. for Embiid notifications. Yeah, yeah. I, like I, I think somewhere along the way, like in this whole entire coaching search. <laughs> sorry, sorry, everyone. I'm I'm looking at my phones. James Ham um, looks down. And go there. It is. What? <laughs> yeah, Monty's on the phone. <laughs> I I think it's it's Aaron, really it's like the, what what sneakers just had a yeah. new drop. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think that that's one of the things that have been totally missed in this thing. It's about how much you know Mark Jackson turned something around and all this. Like Mike Brown is a really really good coach, man. He is. He's a a winner. He's a guy who's the only time he didn't win is for some reason he took a job to go back to Cleveland yeah. and, and take over a team without LeBron James that was in shambles after he left. So, yeah, mm. I, I really, like, that is something that people are just flat out missing for some reason. They think of him well, as some sort of retread. Well, claiming LeBron James got the Cavs to the finals and Mike Brown had nothing to do with it is is stupid because if you feel that way about Mike Brown, you have to feel the exact same way about uh, Mark Jackson. If mm -hmm. Mike Brown had no influence on the Cleveland Cavaliers winning 60 games a couple of times, 50 games a couple of times, and getting to the NBA Finals and getting to the playoffs year after year after year, then you believe that Mark Jackson has absolutely nothing to do with the ascension of the Golden State Warriors. So mm -hmm. keep the same energy. If you're going to use one to 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 knock down one of the candidates, that's fine. I can take the same thing and say it about the other candidate. Right. Well, that and I'll add this too. The first time around with LeBron, that team was horrible. That was Mike Brown and LeBron James backpacking that team to the finals. Mm -hmm. You have to go back and remember how bad the team was. The team was not good around LeBron at all. And he just kept carrying that team all the way. To, but also the defensive skill set, the, de the defensive scheme of Mike Brown helped carry that team. And, you know, it's not the same team that went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Golden State Warriors for all those years. that's It's not the same team. You, you forget the first iteration of the Cavs trying to make it to the finals with LeBron was was totally different. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely agree. Um, okay. I'm beginning to think someone said, guys, let's just sleep on it. <laughs> guys, let's just, let's take, guys, let's take the weekend, <laughs> reconvene here Monday. And uh, big ahead coach, huh, guys? Have a good weekend. Yeah, yeah. Tell the moms you know, we said hi. That would be a, a bad job. That would be like a bad seven job. seven teams, right? They got about Kings PR, man. Come on, you guys got to understand the moment. Because if you make the call right now, you'll get the attention if it's Mark Jackson tonight. Because they're on ESPN, right? Yep. Yeah. They're 630. On so you'll get that attention, you know. And then if it's Mike Brown – You'd get the same attention tomorrow. Tomorrow night, TNT. So bad job, bad job. If if, if they really did say we'll wait to the weekend, bad job. 
You got to do it for the gram. For the you got to do it now. Yeah. Right now. Hey, I just got another Joel Embiid alert, James. <laughs> just want to let you know. <laughs> Joel Embiid back for game three. <laughs> Oh man! Uh, oh, here's, right. here's another question. This I feel like this is the Tyrese Halliburton knee injury all over again. Oh, like my how God. we just waited and waited and Bro, waited for the Tyrese days. news to come, we're and it never, it Maybe. never arrived. James, to your knowledge, um, was Sabonis contacted? Was the <laughs> contacted? Um. I know. Okay, so Sabonis said he would like to be part of the discussion. I don't know. To my knowledge, I do not know that. Um, I do know that De'Aaron Fox wanted to be kept in the loop, and I'm pretty sure that's happened. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm gonna assume that they were kept in the loop, and that at least a discussion with Sabonis has happened. Um, but still, like I don't know for sure uh, when it comes to Sabonis. What? So, and I hope what? that Sabonis is at home enjoying like being a dad for the first time. Real quick, what do you, what did you, we might have asked you, and maybe I forgot, but what do you think about that? Like those guys asking to, you know, not make the decision, but be a part of it, keep me in the loop, or Sabonis in his case, like, yo, really talk to me, ask, ask my opinion. What, what do you think about them wanting to be active in the coaching search? Um, I, I'm totally fine with it. I mean, it depends on the player, you know, like Harrison Barnes laughed it off and said, like, anyone's going to ask me a question in, in this situation. They better have asked Harrison Barnes. Like, if you mm -hmm. want to know if some of this stuff and, and look, it, it's a tip of the iceberg thing. That's, that's what we hear with a lot of this. Like the stories that we've heard with some of the Mark Jackson stuff is like the tip of the iceberg. But Harrison Barnes will know he'll be able to spill the beans on like some of the things that happen if he feels comfortable. Uh, then again, maybe he wouldn't. And, uh, and you know, someone brings up a good point. Was was uh, Chemezi Metu uh, consulted? Because um, Chemezi <laughs> Metu, no, I mean, he like, you don't want to, con Freak. like, consult him and, like, say, hey, uh, or should we hire Martin? But he, he did spend a lot of time with Mike Brown uh, with the Nigerian national team. And so, yeah, mm -hmm. like, there is, um, you have a bunch of ties here. Uh, and also, like, even say this, like, you know, Wes Wilcox worked with Mike Brown during the Cleveland era, like the first Cleveland era. He was an assistant coach uh, the year before Mike Brown came in and took over the job, but then he shifted to the front office and was there for, I don't know, like maybe four or five years, maybe even a little bit longer than that. So he knows Mike Brown very well. And so I think we're having, there is enough data here. The, the, the Kings have enough information. Vivek was there in Golden State while some of these things were happening. Uh, with the Warriors, he knows firsthand what was happening, what wasn't happening. Some of the time, um, you know, it's it's one thing to be in a locker room; it's another thing to be, you know, minority owner and hear some stuff. But uh, yeah, I, this is it's going to be interesting. Like, I, I'm intrigued by how it plays out, and and like if there is like this huge internal struggle inside, like who wins the internal struggle? Because that's mm -hmm. always going to be. I think that will probably mean as much to this as as who the guy is that's hired. Do you think it is? Do you, do, you, do you think this is really like the conversation happening at the Golden One Center right now is, or the Sawyer or wherever their offices are is Favec versus, I guess, everyone else? No, like, I don't think so. I, I think that it's an honest discussion. Like, they're all sitting around a board and, uh, you know, a, a big table and, and they're saying, okay, this is why. I present this case and someone else is saying, this is why I like this candidate and they're having an honest discussion. And, you know, at some point, uh, you know, I'm sure someone jokingly just throws their arm up and like, let's just start over. Um, you know, or someone says, oh, well, let's just meet in the middle and, and hire Steve Clifford. Um, you know, I, I think that there is a lot that goes into all of these discussions. And, um, you know, again, like if you're, I don't know what the home run is here. We we can't really guess. Like, we'll never know. Like, who would have been the the right answer? Um, because you know, both candidates could fail. Mm -hmm. Both could succeed. Um, we have no idea how it will go. Only one of them will get an opportunity to show us what he had. Uh, you know, what he was able to accomplish. 
And that's something that, you know, someone will hang their hat on that, see, I was right, this guy was fine, uh, hmm. that he, he was the right pick. But you'll always have the other person, well, yeah, but I didn't get my guy, so how do we even know? Um, I, I just think that, it, it, you know, it there's a lot riding on this, and whoever does actually get their guy, they're staking their reputation, at least in Sacramento, at least this time around, on a a coach and uh and if i'm a gm who's never been able to hire my own guy i want to hire my own guy and if that if it does end up being mark jackson that he wants to hire then so be it if it does happen to be steve clifford or mike brown like that would be my only case it's that the final decision should come down to the guy who his career and his job is writing on it mm. and you know on that decision that the guy that he thinks he can work with the best that he can, you know, have a symbiotic relationship that works the best. And, um, uh, you know, again, if, if Monty McNair thinks that that is Mark Jackson, he's going to get asked quite a few times about that a, a, at the press conference. But, uh, but if that's who he feels like he's the most comfortable with, then that's the guy he should choose. I, I agree with that. I think um, Monty McNair should make the choice and, it should be him and Wes Wilcox it could be, it should be their, their show. Right. But I made the argument earlier, whereas, and I'll push back just a little bit, James, where if I'm Vivek Ranadive, if this all goes bad, they're blaming Monty McNair. If this all goes bad, I may fire you, Monty. You'll be fine. You'll get a job. And all you'll do at the next stop is like Sacramento. What do you expect me to do? You'll be fine. The one that has everything riding on this, reputation-wise at least, is Vivek Ranadive. And once again, I agree. He should say, hey, Monty, this is your call. Do what you got to do. But also, I don't lose sight of the fact of Vivek saying, hey, this is my butt on the line, not yours. Because I'm the one that's going to sit here. I got to deal with everything the James Hands, the D Lo and KC's, all the tweets, all the fans telling me I need to get out of here. If this goes wrong, yeah, they'll say something about Monty McNair, but it's always going to come back to me if I give you this opportunity. So you better get it right. I think Vivek has more pressure than anybody and more that he's facing to, to deal with than anybody in this whole deal. And because of that, like, I could, if if that is on the plate for me, if I'm Vivek, it's, you're gonna you gonna hear what I got to say, because I got the most to stake. I'll say this: um, if if it is Mark Jackson, that is Vivek putting his neck on the line, and and that is where he actually is the one who is has pushed for that candidate. And if it is that candidate and things go wrong, he is going to get absolutely crushed in Sacramento. If it's Mike Brown and that is Monty McNair's candidate and that's who they go with and it doesn't work out, Monty will get fired and Vivek will be able to say, look, I let Monty do it his way. It didn't work out. Now, as far as like fans in the building and win-loss record and all that, yes, Vivek will still take a beating because he hasn't found success. But there is a huge risk for Vivek specifically in this situation. If his candidate is the guy and you let, uh, you didn't let a, your basketball people make the decision and B you looked past, you know, uh, what really at, at the end of the day is a candidate with three years of coaching experience. Um, that that's a, it's a tough risk. I mean, if you're, and if he feels like he can take that risk and, uh, and, and it hits, well, you know, he's the guy who delivered it, but you know, that that's where you should be looking at, like, what is it? Uh, Along came Polly. Is that the movie where Ben Stiller is a risk management assessor? Mm -hmm. Uh, like, like I would want to pull in the risk. Let it rain! Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and I'm going to tell you that there's one of these guys that's low risk and one that's extremely high risk if we're looking at it that way. But how much of this is actually a risk for Vivek? And I think this was kind of part of Kenny's point too. He's going to get blamed whether this works or not. 
I don't think so. Like, I think if he let his basketball people make the decision, then you fire your, that's, that's how you insulate yourself. That's how other, no, but that's how other owners insulate themselves. They have a general manager that makes the basketball decisions. And when those basketball decisions don't work out, they fire that person and they move on to the next one. There isn't with every organization in this, in the league, this question as to who was it that made the draft pick? Who was it that drafted, right. uh, yeah, who, who drafted Marvin Bagley? Yeah. Uh, like, we don't have, that's not some mystery with every other franchise in the league. It's really only a mystery here. And, and that's because you have an owner that has been known to get involved in these situations. But it's and not so- just the owner, it's the infrastructure of the organization that's always been mm-hmm. piss poor. Mm-hmm. Like you've got advisors and GMs and assistant GMs and you hire a general manager, but you hire his assistant with them. And then you've got this advisor who oversees everybody, but he doesn't oversee enough people. So he quits. Like it's, it's always like the organizational tree, if that's what it's called. I can't remember what it's called in business. That's it. It's, it's, it's a disaster. It's an absolute disaster. It's just a bunch of zigzag. It's not even a tree. It's a not a tree. It's something else. I'm not witty enough it's, to figure out what it is, it's but it's not, it's a, not tree. a tree. It's not. It's a wall of brambles. I don't it's know. A, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's that. yeah. It's it, you're right. You're right. It's it's not a it's not a tree. <laughs> I, I, I agree. Like I totally agree. But you know, like at the end of the day, if you're the guy who who puts your stamp on it, and I, I don't know, like there at some point we got to try something different. We we've, we've done this nine times. Uh, for nine years. We've done this for nine years with Vivek. A- and I hope that he's learned the whole time. And, and um, but like everything about this coaching sh- search tells me that we're like fighting that last moment of did he learn or did he not? And and you're hope- hoping that he did, that he has sure. learned from what's happened here over the last nine years. So let me ask you real quick. And I, I agree with you. Let Monty make the decision. But what did he learn? Because if we're being real with ourselves the two times of x said this is the guy that i want they were the two guys that everybody's liked the times he let the basketball people do what they wanted to do they burned them we got george carl and luke walton <laughs> they well, burned I, them. I would like to tell you that 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 is just one part of it and that that's how he can say like why i think i should find the guy but he played a huge role in firing Michael Malone. He played a huge role in in the Dave Yeager situation and how things played out here in Sacramento. There there is not there there is enough evidence to to tie him to both of those situations extensively. So why as, do we have a general manager happened. here? Just let him be Jerry Jones. If he wants to be Jerry Jones, let him be Jerry Jones. Yeah. Well, I mean there's a reason why I mean, you have to, somebody has to make basketball decisions. And so, yeah, like, look, I, I hope that he learns and I, I hope that like he grows through this but process. But the fact that the story is even out there suggests to me that he hasn't. Either he hasn't learned or the story's fake. There's no in between. He either hasn't mm-hmm. learned from all of these experiences that you've outlined or the story is BS. The story that he wants Mark Jackson? The story that it's Vivek versus Monty. I'm not suggest like because because there's a there's a plausible Vivek really likes Mark Jackson you know that that's okay cool yeah so does Wes Wilcox but yeah no yeah it's cool they 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 like Mark they like uh, Mike Brown too that that's very plausible but it's pitted as it's a it's the mega powers explode it's it's, it's the clash of the titans it's 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 Vivek Ranadive and 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 Mark Jackson versus. Mike Brown and Monty McNair. Like the fact that that's out there is either Vivek hasn't learned or the story's fake. Cause I don't, I don't see how there's an in-between there. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there is always the possibility that someone is like, we know he likes Mark Jackson and they run with that. But that's still, that's still, that's not the narrative though. Like that paints a fake story to me. Yeah. No, I I get you. I I mean, I, I think that there is enough of that out there. Um, where you are concerned that some of what you're hearing isn't a hundred percent, but like I've done enough, like calling around that there are enough people that know that Vivek's sinking and all that stuff. Like they, they understand. 
and, and then I, and then we know enough about what McNair would like, like I you know touching base base with enough people. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I mean, this is that moment though. Do you relinquish some control? And I think we've seen little bits of it during the Monty McNair era, where he has won little battles, little battles, little battles here and there. And on occasion, you lose one, but the one you lose might be so small that it doesn't really matter, anyways. Um, but yeah, I, anyway, Tyrese feels like a big battle if if it was one. Well, I mean, I think everybody Maybe in the it building, wasn't. everybody in the building loved Tyrese. It, it came down to can you do you think you're getting a better player? And that's at, at the end of the day, that's where they went. You know, can you improve the talent on the team? That's that's the name of the game. Hmm. James looked at his phone phone once in the last oh, hour and upsetting, very upsetting. Show them beat update. Well, I, I get buzzes on my watch too. So. I, I got it. So. I, I, I got it. I, I've why I don't wear don't, my watch don't, during don't the look, show. Don't look down. Don't look down. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. I, well, I mean, I, yeah, we're running out of time. That's it. I, Sorry, I, folks. I guess. I guess. Uh, I guess we'll. I guess we'll end the radio show. <laughs> I, I really, I, I really don't know what to tell you. I, I, I don't know what's going to happen. What if, did we um, do wrong? <laughs> if 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 the Kings name a head coach, maybe maybe we'll be back. Maybe we won't. You know, Deuce and Mo will be out there. There there'll, there'll be content for you. Um, Kings are ass for this, though. I just I just want to say that Kings the Kings suck for this. Uh, 